And, uh, I'm John Best, Chair of LitFest, and I'm delighted to welcome you all. Uh, this is uh, the second time this year LitFest has had the privilege of hosting Lodestone Poets, who uh, were uh, created um, five years ago by Sarah Estrek, Leslie Sharp, and Dave Wakeley, all of whom are here present. Um, although uh, Dave is represented by a photograph rather than a moving image, but uh, he's here audibly. Uh, and uh, they did a great job. And I thought the last Lodestones event that you did for us was really superb. I'm going to hand over imminently to Leslie Sharp, one of the founders, uh, who's going to start the ball rolling of what I hope will be a smorgasbord of excellent poetry as always. So over to you, Leslie. Thank you, John. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people here for what I hope will be a really amazing evening. And I was just thinking today how way back at the beginning, Sarla and I used to go to the T.S. Eliot Awards together for quite a few years, didn't we, Sarla? And uh, we sat in the foyer one time at um, the South Bank there at the Royal Festival Hall and we went through names for this group we were going to start, poetry things. And we went through groups of animals and we went through groups of colours and we went through all these kinds of things and we came up with lodestone. And a lodestone is a magnet, it draws together, um, well it just draws together, it attracts and it brings together the very best and that's certainly been our experience and we've, we've always seemed to hover quite close actually to the T.S. Eliot um, prize as well, haven't we? Uh, we had Jacqueline Safra for the first one and um, that before, I think we asked her before she was before she was uh, shortlisted. So a little bit of glamour there. So my great great pleasure to introduce um, Dave Wakeley, who's one of the founders. He worked as a musician, a university administrator, a poetry librarian, and an editor in locations as disparate as Bucharest, Notting Hill, and Milton Keynes. So he's quite a Renaissance man. He was shortlisted for the Manchester Fiction and Bath Short Story Awards, and his writing has appeared in many literary magazines and anthologies. He's very talented. So, Dave. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Apologies for appearing before you as I do, uh, but I'm currently recovering from surgery on my nose. And I would rather not be seen and I suspect you'd rather not see me as, I, as I'm currently looking. So <clears throat> there's a static image of what I look like um, for those of you that don't already know me. Uh, and I'm just going to read you three short poems to start this evening. The first is called Rivers uh, and this poem's uh, about to be published in Lighthouse Journal. Rivers. We should meet like rivers, the soft murmur of association and the deeper rumble of merger before the calm flowing of a single stream. No quick alarm, no twisted metal, not in these flatlands, where the first kiss is telegraphed home before the lips have parted, where the merest crack becomes a chasm. We should prefer the gentle arc of slow, wide corners, the ease of slipping under simple bridges, favour winding progress over whistling way. No, no need for flaming beacons, we should meet like rivers, not like trains. Second poem I'm going to read uh, is called Bletting, uh, which I'm delighted to say I've just literally a couple of days ago uh, heard is going to appear in the next edition of Spout Magazine. Bletting. Time roses away from the depths of winter now though we still bail its waters from the bilges of our creaking, leaky vessels. It's chilly damp lingering in our trouser legs. Anxiety is blessed by a season's overthinking. It's optimism that navigates us onward now. Each tiny pop of blossom bud burst, a baby's breath in our deflating water rings. A tiny gust into our tattered sails, propelling us on to the opposite shore, where the bark break glimmer of the first new leaves hangs around the twig tips like smoke. And the last poem I'm going to read you is Whisper Me This. Whisper me this. Close your eyes, sweet friend. 
fasten them tight against the darkness. Let your senses persuade you that this arm across your chest is the seatbelt of a sleek saloon as it whisks you down nighttime roads to a waterside cottage where a boat waits on the jetty that points into the silent creek. Let this warm skin against your back be the soft leather of a business class seat on a private long haul flight away from this all this here and high above any threat of turbulence. Let them tell you that this touch of fur against your shoulder is the fleece inside a sheepskin jacket, womb warm and wonderful on a winter walk into the wilderness. Believe that the fingers that brush the hairs on your sleeping chest and this cool breath on your neck are just a wind in your feathers as you ride a welcome thermal over the cliff edge and out to a clear blue sea. Thank you for listening to those. Let me now hand you over to the first of our guest poets this evening, Mark Pajek. Um, Mark has written for the BBC, The Guardian, London Review of Books. Um, uh, hearing my screen that I'm reading from with, uh, with Pajek. His work has been three times included in the National Poetry Competition's winners list awarded first place in the Bridport Prize, and has also received a Northern Writers Award, an Eric Gregory Award, and a UNESCO International Writing Residency. His first full collection, Slide, is published by Cape. Uh, I have to say it's probably my favorite first collection of the last two or three years. So I, it's, it's a huge pleasure for me to introduce Mark to you this evening. Let me stop sharing my screen so that you can see as well as hear him. Take it away, Mark. Thank you so much for that, Dave. Um, that's really, really kind words. I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, you big flirt. Thank you so much. Uh, so just before I begin, um, I would just like to let you know, a lot of my, my work uh, deals with a lot of subjects that could could be triggering so there will be and these the poems i've selected tonight as well are, are no different there are might be themes of um cruelty some of abuse uh, some of self-harm but um i've also thrown just to to you know mix it up a bit i've also thrown a streaker poem in there as well so hopefully if if streaker streakers are triggering to you i i, I can only apologize so this first poem is uh, is the first poem in my new collection slide. This is called Reset. She chafes a flame from the lighter, listens to its gush of butane. This 13 year old hunkered down behind the PE hut. For a full minute, she watches the raw, egg-white heat quiver round its yolk. Then she unthumbs and the flame slims out. She tugs back her sleeve on a scar, a small pink socket in her forearm. She holds her breath and plugs in the hot lighter. Her lips clench white. Eyes into walnuts. The metal cap fizzing into skin and fat. And this is how she deletes herself. Her mind's blank page, a kind of snow blindness. Then all her muscles go slack. She opens her eyes for what feels like the first time. Let's out the breath taken in by someone else. Uh, so this next poem is um, growing up, me and my friends did a lot of stupid things. It's a wonder we have all our fingers, limbs, everything. I had a friend 
who set fire to me once for a bet. So it's it's a miracle I'm here at all. But this is based on one of uh, one of those times that didn't go exactly to plan. Trick. Inside this disused tool shed in Hammer Wood, slattered walls morse daylight on an earth floor. Here, two local boys find a knife, its blade freckled in rust. The older boy picks it up with its egg whiff of wet metal and points to his friend to back against the wall for a trick. Then the younger boy's t-shirt is hustled over his head and rolled into a blindfold. In its blackness, he imagines the moment held like a knife above his friend's head. His friend who whispers, don't move. And then there's a kiss, lips quickly snipping against his. Silence. He's aware of his chest, the negative of his T-shirt. He pulls his blindfold, looks the older boy full in his up close face and sees that he's bleeding everywhere under his skin. So, because I've been a, a poet for uh, well over a decade now, I've also worked as a waiter and a barman in many different professions and a lot of other uh, minimum wage jobs. Uh, although I'm not the barman in this poem, uh, it's it's sort of based on half stories that I'd heard from many different people. This is called Crystal. Last orders. I put my cloth to a misty wine glass and twist the shine in like a light bulb. At the end of my bar, a girl, maybe 20. Her back turned on her pint and a man's hand spilling a powder. A hiss from an envelope, like a slow fuse. Her lager's fine chains of fizz suddenly shake until all the liquid is the white tail of a rattlesnake. But it's late. So I, Hold up the wine glass, fill it with the bar's dirty light. Hang it on the rack where it slides to snap against the bowl of another. That chime, the sound of glass almost breaking. I slowly twist and hang, twist and hang with such crystal concentration, I nearly don't notice when she finally stands to leave. Her spine wags and is steadied by a man's hand. The last wine glass is hung. Upside down, they are a line of bells without tongues. Clear now. When she turns her face on his shoulder, 
she is younger than 18. They leave behind her pint glass, a last dreg, a spray of white, asking to be washed and polished and held up to the light. Uh, so if one of the, the ways I, I come up with poems is I try to take two things that shouldn't fit together but do and are changed by that. I think that's quite, it can, it's quite common in, in a few poets. I know that Simon Armitage does something quite similar. Uh, and this is one of the poems that came out of that. If you've never been to Edale, you should go to Edale. It's got some great pubs. But you, there's a, a hill there called Mamtor, which is mentioned in this, and it's just a big hill. Spitting distance. Near Edale, I find a live rifle shell, like a gold seed in the earth. So I load it into my mouth and go on walking. The sun breathing down my neck, the head of Mamtor rising and the path falling like a braid. So this is what it's like to be a gun. Copper bleeding on the gums, the domino click in the teeth. At the blue summit, I look down with my new perspective at the warped floor of Derbyshire, to where a village pools in a valley and a chimney hangs from the sky on a white string. And I watch with hunger, the red dot of a car stop at a crossroads. I suck hard on the blunt bud, drawing out its deeper flavor of powder, smoke down the barrel of my throat. Then it hits me that there's another side to this. And I lay in the warm heather, a body with a bullet in its head, staring at this sky, its clouds blown open, its sudden night. So this next poem is called A Set Place and it's it's based on um, a little bit of family folklore. Uh, it is the unusual way that my aunt let her partner know that she was pregnant. A Set Place. Tonight, to show her husband she is expecting, my aunt, is setting an extra place at their dinner table. On the cooker, blue flames tickle under a pot, the lid just starting to stutter, sweet smell of carrots going soft. And because ultimately the pregnancy will fail, Allow her this set place to put things on hold. Here, let the clean knife hold a sliver of ceiling in its blade. Let all the dining room be trapped in the bubble of the wine glass. And let the fork hold open its little silver palm as this wooden chair 
with the plush bump of a cushion in its lap, holds no one. So it's just been a, an icy couple of days. I thought I'd throw in an icy poem. Uh, I'm I'm from Liverpool, as you can probably tell by my very thick Scouse accent. Uh, I'm from Toxteth, and I used to live on Bentley Road. And I will let you draw your own conclusions whether this poem is based on reality or not. Dare. You dare me to cross Bentley Road naked. It's 3 a.m. and we're the only two awake. Under street lights with cough drop orange bulbs. It's icy. The frozen road shines like treacle. And my penis has slunk like a hand into its sleeve. Each bare foot lifts with a slight adhesive rip. But when I reach you, waiting on the opposite curb with your arms full of my clothes, your bashful head bowed, but your side on eye unblinking as a fish, the streetlight's glow has a whiskey warmth. Your brow sweats. My wet mouth steams open. And I dare you. I dare you. Ooh, uh, that one makes me blush. Excuse me. <laughs> right. I'm just gonna read you, um, I'm just gonna read two more poems. Uh, tonight. Uh, this this first one, this is based on a friend's experience um, on, a, on a battery egg farm, uh, even though it's written in the, the first uh, person, it's, it's a friend's experience and it's taken off of his. Brood. At 16, I did a day's work on an egg farm, a tin shed the size of a hangar. Inside its oven dark, 2,000 stacked cages, engines of clatter and squawk. My job, to shine a torch through the bars for the dead hens and pack them tight into a bin bag. All the time my mind chanting, there's only one hen. Just one ruined hen repeated over and over. In this way, I soothe the sight of all that caged battery their feathers stripped to stems, their patches of scrotum skin, their bodies held in the dead hands of their wings. But what kept me awake that hot night in my box room, as I listened to the brook outside chew on its stones and the fox's human scream was how those thousand, thousand birds had watched me. And really it was me repeated over and over, set in the amber of their eyes. Me, the frightened boy in jeans stiff with chicken shit carrying a bin bag full of small movement, a foot that opened, an eyelid that unshelled its blind nut, a beak mouthing 
a word. I am available for children's parties, by the way. Just want to throw that out there. So this is the last poem I'm going to read for you this evening. But before I do, I just want to say thank you so much to Lodestone Poets for inviting me to come out of this. I absolutely love this job and it wouldn't be possible without nights like this and audiences like you. So thank you for coming out and supporting us tonight. This last poem is um, the only love poem I've ever written and it was for my oldest and best friend, uh, Jeff. After closing time. We head to the edge of town, to the Black River and Old Stone Bridge. Two boys followed vodka, tipping side to side like flames. And for a laugh, we climb the railing and hang from our arms. Below in the deep, two boys peer up at us over their feet. Like drops of water, we are gathering ourselves to fall. One of us says, you go first. And we echo this back and forth. We are here for a very long time. Years, in fact. I marry, divorce. You skip all that become a father, we see less and less of each other. Now we are what the world considers men, which is to say we've learned that falling is inevitable. Yet here we are still, side by side, two boys way past closing time, holding on, until the other, let's go. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I really, I really um, thank you for those really powerful um, poems and very movingly read as well. Um, I really. Um, what's something that's very special about these Lodestone Poets evenings that we're now having um, in partnership with Milton Keynes Literary Festival is that 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 good block of time that we give each poet so we really get to really immerse ourselves into the work of the poet and um, yeah I think that's a really special experience so thank you Mark and I'm really looking forward to our other um, main readers. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Gita. Gita Raleigh is a writer poet and doctor born to Indian immigrant parents in London. Her poetry has been published by Magma, the Rialto and Poetry Birmingham among others. Her debut pamphlet, A Terrible Thing, was published by Bad Betty Press in 2020 and her second, Siren, by Broken Sleep Books in August 2022. She holds an MA in Creative Writing, an MSc in Medical Humanities, and teaches creative writing to undergraduates at Imperial College. She is a London Library Emerging Writer for 2022 to 23, a member of the Kanara Poetry Collective, and a trustee at Spread the Word. So Gita, very pleased to see you. Thank you very much for having me, Leslie. It's so wonderful to be here with the Lodestone Poets and um, our amazing guest readers. I'm going to start with a poem from my first pamphlet from Bad Betty, which is um, a poem written for my daughter. Um, and it's a title poem of the pamphlet. Um, I should just say there's some words in Hindi, but I, I think the meaning is kind of explained as we go along. So I'll just start. A terrible thing. Things break, Betty, my little one. I'm sorry I yelled and you cried. Sorry for the shattered snow globe, its fairy tale plastic shards and glittering tears. But secretly, I'm glad. 
I've told you the stories, haven't I? On the path to Nanny's house, a share stalks us. For each gulab that blooms, a hundred kante, prick small fingers. Rain clouds, not sunbeams, darken our garden. A sob hisses from overgrown grass. For the bulbul who sings, sweet as you, daughter. Somewhere a pinjara swings from a balcony. Tiny nightingale, all I can do is fling the cage door wide, hope you fly. Secretly, I'm glad you know how it is to break a thing and live, the thing forever broken. So the next few poems I'm going to read are from my um, newest pamphlet from Broken Sleep. Um, and I should probably say that the title of the pamphlet was sort of what gave me the idea of grouping these poems together. The idea that the siren was originally um, for the ancient Greeks, half woman, half bird. They were Persephone's handmaidens who were given wings in order to search for her when she was abducted um, to the underworld by Hades. And then subsequently, over the centuries, they became associated with the figure of the mermaid, the half fish, half woman. And in the pamphlet, there's a sort of progression, I think, from the, the uh, mermaid figure, um, the half fish, half woman, often quite helpless, um, a fish out of water, really, someone who, who may not be able to speak the same language. And this figure was sort of associated um, with the immigrant woman for me. And then there's a progression towards this kind of more powerful and almost more terrifying figure of the half bird, half woman um, as we go through the book. But I'm just going to start with the first um, poem. And it's uh, very much indebted to Adrian Rich's wonderful poem, Diving into the Wreck. And it's called Mermaid Visits the Archive after Adrian Rich. By the shore, she recalls, once diving the wreck. Though they told her never to adventure its depths or harvest its bones cast as oracle on ocean floor. She witnessed a rotten hull give way from tarry gloom, the dull gleam of mercury, copper ingots, coals clink. She longs to recall the stink of death. No documents, but paper dissolution. She seeks herself in ivory and iron, salt cured skins, elephant tusks, stone shot, fragments of pelvis. Later, she learns to hide her tail beneath long skirts. Land dweller, she gathers a form from museum dust. Between mammoth and meteorite, she reads of affinity with elephants, her twin pairs of breasts, how when strapped to a mast, she gains ecstasies, a voice pitched to scream, which some sailors call her song. She feels the stones waiting her chest, ghosts of coins spill silver from her mouth. And the next poem I'm going to read is um, part of the same sequence in which the sort of um, immigrant woman, the migrant woman of the mermaid becomes a uh, male wife. And there's, there's some references in it to the uh, Hindu marriage ceremony. So this is called Mermaid Becomes Male Wife. Hands slashed by coral and rock, flowering stems bleed on her palms. Swaddled in silk to conceal her tail, six woven yards of crimson brocade. Wedding guests in scarlet or saffron, blue or green risk summoning oceans. A woman paints eyes on her closed lids. Another plaits gold in sea tangle hair. Wrists bound to his, mermaid feels a sacred fire tongue at her throat. Softly, a priest chants incantations. He yanks her chains until she nods, yes. 
So um, the next poem I'm going to read sort of takes this figure of the hybrid or um, I guess monstrous woman a little bit further and it's um, a found poem from uh, an academic paper actually which is called, I think I've got this right, um, Monster Culture Seven Theses. So my poem also has seven parts and it's called On the Female Monster. One, the monster's body is a cultural hybrid, defying annexation with green vapor and polyphony. Vitality stalks her imperiled hair, both warning and portent. She wreaks desire and feminine upheaval. Two, the monster always escapes with her freakish propensity to shift and vanish. Like bones or geographic talisman, she fragments aberration with her dangerous refusal, bifurcating, and slash or, either slash or. Three, the monster is the harbinger. We are violated in the cyber resistance of the monster's body, which logically devours hypermasculine and divisive human history. Four, the monster dwells at the gates. The undead ocean returned to live among us, a dispossessed hydra, the planet in pain, incorporated as haunting. Five, the monster polices the borders of grotesque prohibition. Two living bodies engulfed and bound, she and them, Virago, Lilith. Sycorax. Six. Fear of the monster is really desire. Every sublime glimpse cast a sculpted dance, lascivious imaginary, exoticized beauty, disturbing rape. Seven. The monster stands at the threshold, asks us how asks us why, asks us what is sanctioned, what is forbidden. Thank you. So the next poem is also, I guess, sort of monstrous. Um, as, um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a medical doctor. Um, and this poem uh, is about sort of returning, I think, to um, uh, a time when I was a, a, a medical student. Um, and the idea of monstrosity and it talks about the anatomy museum, which is a place where you sort of go when you're quite a naive sort of 18 year old and you see sort of really human remains um, preserved uh, in sort of boxes and jars and it's really quite terrifying. Um, so it's a prose poem, so I'll just read it through and it's a poem I haven't read before so out in public so um, excuse me if I stumble a little. So the poem's called Museum of Anatomy. Here's the task at hand. She will dissect, display the nerves and muscles of the chest, blood vessels, trembling, reedy paths. An airless room, braced with the stench of formalin. Some jester tosses the bones of the wrist, scaphoid, capitate, lunate, worn as ivory dice. Around them are containers of dismantled bodies, boxed, scrubbed skulls, glass jars of perishable organs. First, she must lay scalpel to skin, flay it from delicate flesh, feel her areoles shrink and darken in sensory response. At the anatomy museum, her mind wanders on improbable pathways. A vanitas, to consider one's own death. Does she want it science fictional? To end as a brain in a jar, disembodied, soused in liquid selfhood? Or magic realist? A darkly misshapen heart, stuttering ionic laugh from electrolyte bath? A poetic death, 
where bells ring only for the pilgrim who has abandoned her empty temple. She hopes her tongue is last to die, ululating small paroxysms of sound of air. So the last poem I'm going to read, again, I guess, <laughs> sorry to be not very cheerful, but talks about death and talks about how, um, you know, with scientific knowledge, we really try and gather a lot of this from things that are already dead. Um, and in some ways we can never capture from something that's dead what it was, um, the, you know, the true knowledge of, of, of what, um, that consciousness possessed when it was alive and how we can make lots of mistakes in interpretation and science has made lots of mistakes over the centuries um, as a result of this. So the poem is called Auguries. When the birds were dead, we gathered up their small and scattered heads, fired them clean of charred flesh and feather, scoured each to yellow dome. Bleached skulls, lined long wooden tables like cups. In leather aprons, we took their measure. Hollow of bone, lacuni of air, angle of bill, gleam of eye. How breakable they seemed. Blasting them in floods of radiant atoms, we summoned up life on whistle and pipe. Nothing. No song, but quiet. Abandoned, those rows of hollow heads furred with dust. One by one they shattered, their bones flinched beneath our souls. We heard their fluted notes. A sonation of winging ghosts brushed our eyes as they rose. We were blameless, no lies. How could we know what futures the skulls of birds foretold? Our ears too old to hear their singing. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. And I think I'm handing back to Leslie now. Oh, I think you're still muted, Leslie. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Gita. There I was chatting to myself. <laughs> My apologies. I was just singing. I was singing Sarala's praises and saying um, <laughs> how amazing it was to watch her uh, her writing uh, blossom over the years and. Uh, so that I can now tell you that she is a British poet and a writer of mixed European and Indian heritage, a winner of the Poetry School Nine Arches Press Primus competition, a member of the Ledbury Critics Collective. Her debut pamphlet, Say, was published by Flipped Eye in 2021, and her first full collection, After All We Have Travelled, will be published by Nine Arches Press in January 2023, very soon. <laughs> So over to Sarala. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's read this evening. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's always just such a, a privilege to um, attend these, well, co-organise, but also just to attend these evenings where we really get to spend, you know, a lot of time um, with each poet's work. So, um, yeah. I, and, and also one of the um, sort of the, the main ideas behind Lodestone Poets was to bring together uh, more established poets with emerging poets and um, just really sort of creating space for, for those conversations um, and platforms for, for readers to um, share their work at, at every stage of their career. So um, yeah, just delighted to be here in general. And um, I am going to start, um, I'm going to read three poems this evening. And um, the first one um, was written, was, was first drafted um, in a workshop with Shivani Ramlocham 
oh, before I, um, yeah, so I'll go, I'll go straight into that one. I was going to say briefly that um, just by way of introduction, I am going to be reading from the new um, collection coming out in January. Um, and just so you know, sort of the, the themes I'll be exploring. So it's a collection of linked poems um, which explore migration, cross-cultural and interracial relationships, uh, mixed race identity and intergenerational trauma, um, as well as the enduring powers of, of love and connection. So I'll be reading from that to start with. Um, and so the first poem I'm going to read is called An Inheritance and it's dedicated to Shivani Ramlechan. A spirit hovered over the scene where the disobedience occurred. What kind of spirit? I couldn't tell, but it was there, trust me, as her lover leant over her sleeping body and pressed his lips to her neck and back, the crown of her silken, tangled head. Outside, the moon had risen and was slipping through the curtains as a spirit watched a woman turn her sleep-heavy body towards her lover eyes still shut as his hands touched, touched, and her skin rose and the moonlight slipped inside. A bedroom where there was no immaculate white, no unadulterated black. Tonight there were only adulterations Quarterons of light and dark, variations on a variegated spectrum of in-betweens, and this released them. The spirit watched as they, man and woman, swam in infinite spectra of indefinition until they sank, and having sunk, resurfaced, gasped for breath, elation, the terrible orgasmic thrill of creation stroking their flanks, reverberating in their bones, the knowingness of cells, having made an image of themselves inside her. A miniature or photograph, proof of the breaking of unwritten rules of state and above all his parents' wishes. In that moment, the spirit upped and left, vanished into nothing, or maybe something. No one knows for certain, but I have an idea. You see, the image grew. It grew and grew until it had a mouth, nose, cheeks and eyes with which to survey grandparents and state. And when the image was born, the story goes that through the tears of newborn whales, though it was impossible, the baby spirit child arose. So um, sort of continuing on that theme in, in a sense, um, I'm going to be reading a poem which is in sort of in response to um, a statement that Theresa May in 2016, which I know you're all familiar with. Um, so she said, if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. And yeah, that's all I need to say. The next poem was written as uh, a response to that um, statement in part. Um,
Hello, sorry, I'm back. Can you hear me? Sorry, I totally cut out. Uh, sorry, internet, I think. Um, okay, so am I, I'm clear, I'm, okay, that's really, okay, glad to be back. Okay, so it's called, um, the poem is called, I Research the Origins of the Modern Rose and Discover, and it's a, a list poem. I research the origins of the modern rose and discover. One, she is a crossbreed. Two, of Rosa chinensis, Rosa gigantea, and other species. Three, including Rosa gallica and Rosa canina. Four, of which only the latter is native to the British Isles. Five, the rest were shipped from China, India, France, six, etc., etc. Seven, flower with a thousand faces, 6,500 tongues, eight, and almost as many names, nine, Ancestors estimated at 35 million years old. 10. To where does she return? 11. She becomes what she is. 12. Make way, gulab, rose. And final poem. Hopefully I won't have that weird tech glitch. That was really disconcerting again. Um, so the final poem I'm going to read um, is um, called The Gorge. And um, the, the, collect the title of my forthcoming collection is After All We Have Traveled. So there are several journeys, um, both physical and metaphorical, um, that take place in the book. Um, and this next poem is one of them. And it's my final poem. The Gorge. Red ochre, squelching underfoot, holding on to her soles, then relenting, letting go. She walks into the deep green, not knowing which way, but not wanting to turn back. The canvas of green and red blurring her edges making her reckless. Except the granite sky, the wind whipping hard, her shoes ravaged by mud. She finds herself in a gorge, ripe, overflowing, the water tumbling from wet hand to wet hand, creating a dozen fresh water paths. Her foot sticks, Another step and her foot sinks half a metre into the soil. A rustling in the leaves from the trees on her right and the fear never far away returns of being found. By whom? She doesn't know, but the cold knife slicing through her abdomen is real. Terror cuts to her lungs. The red ochre in her veins runs to her heart and flees again, disperses into valves, capillaries. She breathes in red and green as her feet pummel the soil, travel the water paths carved in the earth's skin. This was what she had wanted, to be alone. But not this, the crack and recoil of thunder as gunshot her heart punishing her chest. She wishes she had done something useful with her youth, like learn a martial art. Her youth now almost gone, 34, not young, not old, somewhere in between. She turns back to the trees. Here is a path she recognizes, this ditch, this hassock, it is not the path she'd planned on taking, but she takes it now. Appearing at the front door, mud up to her shins, flushed, 
smiling, I took the long way back. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. So it is now my absolute, absolute um, pleasure to announce um, our final reader of this evening, uh, Victoria Adukwe Bully. So I'll introduce Victoria. Victoria is a poet, writer, and artist, an alumna of the Barbican Young Poets. She is the recipient of an Eric Gregory Award and, her and has held residencies in the US, Brazil, and the V&A Museum in London. Her debut poetry collection, Quiet, Faber 2022, circles around ideas of black interiority, intimacy, and selfhood, playing at the tensions between the impulse to guard one's inner life and the knowledge that, as Audrey Lord writes, your silence will not protect you. Um, and Quiet is just an absolutely astonishing book. So for those of you who haven't already got it, absolutely recommend it. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing these poems, Victoria. Um, please join me in welcoming Victoria. Thank you so much, uh, Sarala, for your incredible introduction and your incredible poems. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for your book. And um, January is only next month. I can't believe that that's how quickly this year has gone. Um, please excuse me for whispering a bit. There's a number of reasons for that. <laughs> um, I've got a newborn, or I not say newborn, he's about eight months now. He's, I've got a baby who is sleeping in the next room, so I'm going to have to be quiet. Um, and um, also, we've all just had COVID here, so my throat is a little bit, it's a bit rough. Um, and hopefully also my internet will hold up. So with all of that being said, I will happily share some poems. Um, from quiet and um yeah and i'm just yeah thank you everyone for being here and to everyone who's read it's been nice to to share to share this space with so many poets who i've not encountered in readings um i've not read with before rather, so i'm happy to be here <clears throat> i'll start with the first poem which is called Declaration. And if you can't hear me, please uh, please do wave. I don't want anyone to be unable to hear me because I'm, I'm a little bit whispery. Okay. Declaration. If sickness begins in the gut, if I live in the belly of the beast, if here at the heart of empire, if careful in the house of the host, if quiet at the hearth of the host, if here at the home of empire, if I live in the belly of the beast, let me beget sickness in its gut. Lost belonging. I left my bag on the train, under the table, forgot it, looking at the sun as I rolled home into the city. Gold was spilling from the frame of a skyscraper and it looked like a fire but it was only nature reflecting off of steel. It was nature at it again, refracting from the metals of this skin that we have grown so lately. Everything is going to break and I must get home before it does or doesn't yet or buckles back to the locked 
shut door to the batteries plus minus all dashed from the clock and the blinds closed tight a millipede of stinging eyes red light crashing through from the place behind them mother where else can i go <clears throat> Um, this next poem is called Essex Playground 2004. And I I don't, if people are, sounds true to me, um, oh, my connection is unstable. Let's hope for the worst. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in in uh, Woodford, which is technically the edge of Essex and is sort of becoming London. So this poem is called Essex Playground 2004. The boys round here, the ones that look like you, don't love the look of you. They like the orange girls, the ones who wear foundation like rapture is any minute and Satan might crawl out of the ground in Essex, wearing jute and bearing handbags. The ones who turn and flick their hair so it cracks like whips on the minds of these boys, the boys that you like, the ones that look like you and your brothers. Fifteen. With his hopscotch grid for a wrist, see my blue boy with a smile like a one string guitar relative to nobody dropping out of school, out of line saying, I love you more than life itself. In a first Valentine's card during the spring term, in which we turn 15. In the attic of an old phone now, here he is again. In the drawer I was emptying, during a hymn I was singing before I met him. And here he is, my blue boy. Now watch this older girl stop and throw her day out with the dust and turn blue to this whole impermanence thing is deceptive. It looks lifelong, actually, to me. Still stuck here, molding mason jars of words to preserve him with. Wondering if a poem 10 years on is still a pining. Asking how many more I'll make, having learned at last how little of us keeps. <clears throat> There's a lot going on here that um, I've got a cat <laughs> who I have forbidden from jumping up onto the bed and um, he's not, he's not, um, he's not heeding my wishes. So, yeah, so far he hasn't, he hasn't done it, but he's thinking about it. <clears throat> This poem is called, not quiet as in quiet, but. Not quiet as in quiet, but. As in peaceful, as in slow to anger, as in shy. As in sulking or sullen, as in nice, as in clean, tree-lined streets as in well-resourced libraries, as in good, outstanding schools, as in not much new, as in no news is good news, as in the war is over, has been for decades now, as in, as in early to bed, curled up with a book, as in the newborn is sleeping, 
as in TV barely audible, as in subtitles, as in subtext, as in someone should have done something, as in don't just do something, stand there, as in could and should but wouldn't, as in well, the British are so polite, as in placid, as in placated, as in nuanced, complicated, as in careful, it's a conflict, not a siege, a conflict, as in objective, as in both sides, as in well behaved, as in safe, as in too quiet, as in almost silent, as in almost no sirens. <clears throat> um, some of the poems in here, it, it's interesting really, when I move through this book, I, I tend to move through it chronologically. And what I like about that is that it, it does contain a kind of um, movement through time. So some of the, a lot of the um, older poems are towards the front and a lot of the newer poems are towards the back. And this poem about Anna was written quite some time ago. Actually, I would say 2016. Uh, in a workshop with Pascal Petit and um, we were all given some images and we had to respond in some way uh, to, to the images and I received an image of a work by the artist Anna Mendieta so you can see her in the image it's sort of a woman <clears throat> who is Anna and this poem describes that image, but also thinks about uh, Anna Mendieta's um, death. <clears throat> At, um, <clears throat> about Anna. The truth is nobody knows how Anna Mendieta met her death. It would appear she was pushed some distance below, the doorman said he heard a woman shout no, and then the sound as her body hit the top of the diner, so hard her face left a mark like a... Oh so <laughs> I have a different edit in my head. So hard her face left a mark like a metal stamp. In the photo, she is naked and feathered. She looks like the first woman, like she doesn't know what a camera is, but somewhere in the world it is believed that these things can steal a soul. Her arms are out as if to say, you move them like this to fly, like this, see, her feet are apart. You can see the sphere of her hips, the delta between her legs. I look at her sated and think this is the true work of the body to adorn itself and be comfortable, unaware. I myself am bored of fig leaves, of shames I did not choose. <clears throat> Speaking of figs, I had the most vivid dream about two weeks ago, and um, I think it was one of those nights where I had maybe multiple dreams, but sometimes you wake up. You, do you ever have, do you ever wake up after a dream, but like you go about your day and then something triggers a memory of the dream and you're like oh my goodness there was there was an image anyway I had this very very vivid dream that I was just eating figs and I'd never eaten figs before in my life um I mean 
I've had like maybe a, a small piece or something you know how they serve them if you go to a fancy restaurant or something and you've got the tiniest starter with a little piece of fig but you know I've never from scratch eaten a fig before and in the dream it was just the most incredible pleasurable uh gourmand I don't know all the adjectives satisfying enriching experience and so I woke up and I was like I'm gonna go buy some figs and I tweeted that I had been interested in trying them and it's interesting the responses that came up not everybody said that they liked figs so anyway I got some from Sainsbury's and to be honest they were out of season by this point and I wouldn't say the flavour was much to write home about, but the texture, my goodness, the texture, wow. So um, I don't know what the dream means, but this next poem is called Dreaming is a Form of Knowledge Production. <clears throat> Dreaming is a form of knowledge production. Nobody's immune to their ego taking the wheel. Dreaming is a form of knowledge production and they don't want it to be that easy for us. As in, lay your head on a pillow, wake up holding something new. I said what I said, not what you say, I said. Pigs are outside the house, but next door this time. It's not something our relationship will be able to survive. He doesn't show it for Kat, but he loves me so. He has the gene, but it hasn't kicked in yet. Another thousand years, all thinking and no feeling. Shut up about Freud. So I think uh, I'm just aware of time. Uh, okay, um, maybe two more. <clears throat> I have no sense of time. Um, let's read air. Friend, I saw you sitting at the window of yourself, high up in the loft watching it all go on without you. I was ice and you were almost shadow. I waved like a child on a passing boat. Unsure of whether or not this counts. Oh, thank you. Unsure of whether or not this counts. I want us to remember the unreadable air, how it waits to be recast by the touch of our lungs, our breath alone, a most humble poem, in, out, the couplet we write without thinking. Don't go, we must stay alive to our place in the family of green, and breathing things that use even our size to make sweetness from light. What grace, allow what is simple to be simple, accept it as truth, quiet as it's kept, we help the trees to breathe too. And let's read just one more. The baby woke up, that's what was happening just then. Um, <clears throat> let's just read one more and it's a short one. Another declaration. Declaration. And should you watch me stop my mouth? It is only to save my breath 
for singing in the world to come. And should you see me hold my tongue, it is to better speak a language among those with whom it might be shared. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. That was really stunning. And I was just struck by um, how language and poems are rather like your cat. They kind of, <laughs> they don't come under our command. And yet somehow, like since we began this evening, like I cast my mind back to Dave at the beginning and it just seems like, how long ago was that? I mean, it's an amazing kind of space that we come into and, uh, and kind of come together in. And I was really struck when I reflected for a moment on just the authority that each person has when they speak in this way. I think it's really moving. I find it very moving. Um, a very different order of language and yet somehow it's captured and uh, shared. It's really, really wonderful. So thank you everybody who came to listen, to read um, and uh, keep warm everyone as you go off into your evening. <laughs> Hope that Laura's chickens are all right in the coop and uh, uh, thank you again for coming, really magical. Thank you. John. Thank you, Leslie. I think that was a, a really wonderful demonstration of the alchemy that is lodestone. Uh, I felt that we saw some really uh, incredible resonant work this evening and so many winners metaphorically and, and literally. So uh, thank you to all six of our readers tonight. And can I encourage um, everybody to unmute and give some audible applause and then I'll follow up with a, a word from our sponsors. So thank you very much, Lodestone. <laughs>